Today I want to talk about software engineering for artificial life, in particular software engineering with the goal of getting artificial lifestyle computations uh, to be able to perform useful computations in the real world. Uh, um, <coughs> this is, uh, well, it's sort of overdue to just sort of have a, one of these research notebook videos. Uh, also, uh, Robert Golosinski in one of the comments below was saying I shouldn't just be posting these talks that I do at conferences, but I should actually be talking directly to y'all and uh, not freaking out about the time limit so much. Uh, so I just want to say, you know, <laughs> you know, be careful what you wish for because this is probably going to go on a little bit, and in the middle, <coughs> it's it's probably going to uh, nerd out pretty hard uh, for a little while because I actually want to look at some code. Um, all right, so uh, the plan is uh, first to get a running start uh, sort of previously on uh, and then talk a, a little bit about where we are now. And, and I feel like I really haven't tried to state that as clearly as I sort of think it is in my head, so I want to take another run at that. Talk a little bit about uh, the Ulam 2, the new version of, of Ulam. We announced Ulam 1, which is called Ulam. Uh, at ECAL at York in England uh, a year ago in a couple of days, so this is almost the anniversary, uh, um, <clears throat> and show a few demos, and then in particular show uh, a demo of a fairly substantial example that I just sort of got working in the last few weeks, uh, which is, uh, you know, I think a little bit badass, actually, uh, um, and take a look at that and then sort of wrap up with, you know, wishing and hoping. Okay. So, if you're just joining us, uh, um, the way we do computing today is based on this idea of hardware determinism. You make the <coughs> physical hardware provide absolute repeatability as good as you possibly can. So that same input, same program, same output, guaranteed. And of course, you know, in the real actual world, nothing really works like that. Everything's got a few little errors and rubs and things go off in some weird way. But a computer, digital computer hardware is designed and manufactured to control that at least as long as it takes to do whatever the computation is. And that's worked really great, but it has also could have gotten us into this bad situation where for the guys who are doing software, they just get to think that reliability is taken care of by magic. And the job of the software guys is to just be as efficient as possible in getting whatever done uh, one wants to get done. The consequences of that is that at the software level, there's essentially no redundancy, no error checking, nothing that you would do if you couldn't rely on an absolute ironclad guarantee from the hardware that everything was going to be deterministic, exactly the same as expected. The world that we are living in today, with all of these crazy security fault, faults and data thefts and breaches and everything getting busted into, that is a symptom, not so much of the fact that programmers are stupid or that companies, you know, ship crap, uh, uh, although both those things might be true in individual cases, but really it's more a symptom of uh, the architecture, the fundamental way that we've architected computers based on this entire hardware determinism, efficient software, uh, uh, is, is broken. and. <clears throat> it's fun to program in it because, you know, you are the utter master of everything that happens. The, the memory, the RAM is just completely passive and you say, you know, put a 1 there, increment that variable, test if this variable is bigger than that variable, and so on. And it does it, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, uh, like that. And, you know, from once you start to get a little good at programming, you know, it really is quite a heady feeling. You know, you can make it do exactly what you want. Uh, uh, you are the master of the universe. You control everything. Granted, it's a fairly small universe, but it's yours, and it's great. But it doesn't scale. It's the dream of dictators everywhere that <clears throat> if I could just get everybody everywhere to obey me exactly, everything would be fine, and it never is. And these attacks that we're having, these computer bugs and viruses, all of this stuff that's happening is because the whole way we've been set up is this sort of totalitarian government where not only do the individual data members that are we're keeping track of everything that's going on, not only do they not have any investment in what's going on, not only are they not allowed to care to say, uh, wait a minute, uh, I, I got changed. 
Uh, uh, they're, they're not allowed to do so. They must be utterly passive. If that was the only way to build computers, well, then okay, we would live with it. But there is another alternative. Uh, and this is what I'm calling living computation. And this is where we don't assume hardware determinism. We say the hardware is going to try to do what it says, but it reserves the right to make mistakes sometimes. And software is going to have to be organized so that it can tolerate some amount of mistakes and still get useful work done. Now, that means the software is no longer going to be able to guarantee to get everything absolutely perfect, but that guarantee was only as good as the hardware guarantee, which was only good up to an asterisk anyway. In exchange for saying that software is going to have to deal with redundancy and taking care of checking its work if it's got a little spare time and so forth, uh, uh, what we get from that is that the job of hardware is to be able to be plugged together as big as we absolutely want to. You need more hardware, just plug more hardware in and never run into a limit where, well, you know, sorry, we ran out of address space, we got no more addresses, whatever it is. Indefinite scalability is the job of hardware, to be able to compute as large as we need. And given that we can no longer assume that we are in this totalitarian, everybody will obey absolutely, instead we are going to let responsibility flow downwards toward the individual agents by making methods where they can say, well, you know, I don't know the big picture, I don't know really what's going on, but I have enough information to know that it would be better if this thing was over there, so I'm going to move it over there and go, bum, bum Member of the team versus master of the universe. And the difficulty is, and so the argument I've been trying to make for eight years now, or in a broader sense for 30 years or more, is that this living computation style where, you know, you, you don't require everybody to be perfect and you get along and you make things better, is a better way to do manufactured computing than the way that we've been doing it. But getting from A to B, getting from the deterministic attractor to the best first attractor is really hard because there are zillions of decisions that we made on the process of coming up with the deterministic attractor that all reinforce each other. And if you try to change just one of them, then it looks much worse. You try to change two of them, it looks much worse still. So the idea is we're going to escape from determinism in two or maybe three steps, depending on how you keep score. The goal is using artificial life technology, things where stuff, you know, software programs are reproducing, they're healing, they're growing, they're having kids, the kids are moving out of the house, all of that uh, uh, in service of useful computations, perhaps driving cars one day. Nowhere close now, but I'm not sure exactly how close the software on the traditional computers are, is either. So how can we do it when you have to change sort of everything at once to leap out of one valley and get into the other? We can do it with a very small strike team that makes an expedition to the other attractor and starts to set up a colony. And that's what we've been doing for the last several years. The steps in building the colony is define uh, an indefinitely scalable architecture, this way of hardware that won't guarantee to absolutely be correct because correctness is not even going to be well defined but will do everything necessary so that if you have real estate power, money, and cooling, you can buy more of these things and plug them together and make a computer as big as you want from here to the horizon. We've done that. Uh, the one that we're doing is called the Movable Feast, the Movable Feast Machine, MFM. Create a programming language that isn't counting on global determinism to deal with it. Now, there's lots of languages, existing languages that one could talk about that might get pulled into this, but we made our own for good reasons, mostly and mostly because we wanted to, because again, you adopt an existing thing from the correct and efficient attractor, it starts to suck you back in. We need to reevaluate every damn assumption that goes into programming languages and so forth. So even though ULAM and ULAM2 looks quite familiar you know, uh, from the surface, and we designed it that way to try to make it a little bit less terrifying to imagine, you know, do I want to take a trip to the colonies? It's got some weird features. It's got some fundamentally weird features, like, you know, unary numbers, for example. You don't find that in many languages. In some ways, it's closer to a hardware description language than to a traditional programming language, because in a way, we're lifting a lot more of the tasks that uh, hardware uh, design 
traditionally would do were lifting them up to the software level, making the hardware level just more uniform and indefinitely scalable. Develop simple tools and techniques. That's what we've been doing all along. We've got these demos. You see some of them on uh, the YouTube channel that do various things. We're continuing to make those, and we'll look at some in a second. But then the next step <coughs> is to go beyond just playing with the tiny little things and start building more advanced tooling, more you know, sort of factory stuff to start of settling down, to actually bring in some people that are not there just because they want to be explorers, but they'll be there because it's going to be useful for them. <laughs> in some way or at least there's a narrative a story that's believable enough about how they're going to get to something that's helpful uh, <clears throat> and to do that we need software engineering to do that we need to be able to go beyond tiny little you know one atom things that do funny stuff to say how can we organize complexity to deal with stuff at multiple spatial scales multiple temporal scales things running quickly inside things running more slowly and so on <clears throat> And that's what we're starting to do. That's what I want to talk about today. In the future, in the near future, hopefully for step five, uh, um, we want to build a next generation hardware tile, indefinitely scalable tile, prototypes that will be you know, absurdly expensive and absurdly weak for what they do. But the goal is for them to collectively allow us to benchmark the average event rate, indefinitely scalable. Uh, the primary metric of these things is not MIPS, millions of instructions per second, but how many events can you deliver to each spot in the matrix that you're working on in a given second, assuming that some of those things are going to have to talk to neighboring tiles, so there'll be communication, coordination involved. Taking all that into consideration, what error can you show us? What average event rate? Events per site per second on average. I will be thrilled uh, if our next generation hardware can show 10 air. I mean, I'll be satisfied if it can show one air because we're just drawing a line in the sand. I'm not a hardware guy. I need hardware help. The point is, is to draw a line in the sand and say, you know, hey, it's starting to look like this architecture could actually be useful for something. I bet these computer engineer guys, especially because now they're liberated from absolute determinism, could just crush this. They could be reaching 10 air, 100 air, who knows. And then with that uh, prototype hard hardware, less and less prototype, more and more useful as time goes by, hopefully uh, uh, we start to actually be able to do system control demos, take a bunch of these guys and, and have them become the sort of skin and brain simultaneously of a little robot, uh, uh, that kind of thing. That's down the road. Okay, so today, more about step four. Oh, and then, you know, step seven, you know, like Lena says, you know, world domination, or as I would say, you know, for the benefit of society. All right, so, <coughs> Ulam 2, announced July 30th, announced today, at least. I'm recording it on July 30th. We'll see when we get through uh, post and so forth. Uh, there's so it's Ulam 2 there's been a bunch of little releases just trying to get the packaging working and uh, MFM 334 might end up being 335 the easiest way by far is to uh, use the personal package archive uh, and install it on Ubuntu any of the current long-term support 1204 1404 1604 on an Intel box 32-bit or 64-bit uh, um, the more machine you've got, the better. If you've got an 8-core burner, well, that would be great. But I mean, it'll even run like, uh, 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 is this thing running? Uh, there we go. So, right, can you see this? Uh, this is my little uh, ancient EPC. I think it's the first generation, 701 or whatever the heck it is. Uh, uh, it's running the burn demo, which is one of the demos, which is included in the Ulan package, which you get if you install. Install now. Uh, um, and, you know, it's running like, it's running like crap, uh, but it is running. Uh, um, it, the simulator will take advantage of as many cores as you've got, uh, uh, but it'll fall all the way back, and things will just get slower and slower and slower. And so, so let's look at that demo. Actually, uh, one of the programs that gets installed is MFZ Run. Uh, uh, MFZ is the packaging format, like a jar or a zip. In fact, it's based on zip. 
uh, um, <coughs> that you can put together with ULAM code, compiled code, and initial kernel configurations that you want to do. If you just type uh, MOC run, uh, you get a bunch of help, and at the very end, you get the list of um, the demos that are included. It, it sticks user bin on, it doesn't really need to. Uh, here's the burn demo that we just looked at uh, uh, on the EPC. It works here too. I was going to show you another one. Uh, let's look at uh, base layer. Is it got a cap in it? Yeah, it does. All right. <clears throat> so this one, uh, look at this. And we got a bunch of these touch reporter guys sort of in the middle. Um, and they are sensitive to, to mouse input. And this is just a tiny little down payment on how the you know the the movable feast grid is, is two dimensional, but it has the potential to interact in the third dimension through the base layer. Uh, and there's a, a library site utils in that you can write code. So this thing is detecting uh, mouse motion. It can detect dragging. It can detect clicking. Although you notice clicking is not necessarily hitting one exact site. It's more like imagining sort of a, a tablet with a, a, a finger. Uh, but also the point is we need to come up with things that will figure out how to debounce that kind of information ourselves rather than just assuming we're going to magically be able to hit the one pixel, the one site that we want to do. Uh, uh, also in this directory is the, uh, the site writer demo. There's a video of that on the channel uh, uh, where, you know, has it started to show up yet? Uh, it's starting to there. Uh, um, where you know it gets color scribbled all over the screen and and even though there's only two atoms there the colors get scribbled everywhere and how is that possible well the way it's possible is because the colors are actually being painted onto the base layer so that the atom can move on and leave an effect in the world this could be used for pheromone trails if one's doing an ant model or a limited sort of communication or a little bit of extra state that's accessible from the site that you're in. And the reason we can see it is because in the full-on version of the simulator, uh, this is where you get the interface. If you dare, you click on more, you get the whole thing. Uh, um, back is uh, what are we going to display in each little rectangle for the site. Middle is what we display in a circle inside that. And front is what we display in a little teeny dot in the center. So we can pick whatever we want for all those three layers. In this case, we're picking the site paint uh, for the uh, to see what the site writer atoms are doing. Now, again, with all of these demos, it's really just the simulator running from a particular initial configuration. So if we want to mess with it, uh, um, we can do that. We can add a bunch more site writers uh, um, and see what happens. We can take site writers and add a bunch of touch reporters and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, um, so, <laughs> man, uh, uh, I told you this is going to go on a while. Uh, um, so we've got all of these demos, um, and and they're great, and they serve, in, in addition to being just sort of fun to play with and fun to look at, what they're doing is they're, they're training our eyes for the kinds of dynamics that happen naturally in these sort of systems. I mean, a lot of these demos you can find in, like, NetLogo, other packages meant for agent-based modeling and so forth. It's all uh, very similar concepts, and they're worth looking at just to see, I mean, like in the burn demo in particular, in a classic uh, burn thing, you know, you can get a loop set and it'll just burn around and around and around forever, which is sort of weird to think about burning. But it's as if you're imagining uh, you have a circular forest and the forest is burning and it, it takes so long to get around the circular forest that the forest has regrown and it's burnable again once the time it gets back. And you can get these ring oscillators going. Uh, and it's a model of things like uh, transmission of signals in, in neurons in your brain. It's related to the, how your heart works, the cardiac muscle pacing, and so on. All of those things are good to teach us what the sort of you know basic resources of our colony are like. But once we've played with a bunch of them, we need to start saying, okay, well, how can we build larger tools with them? And that's where software engineering comes in. And that's where several of the new features of ULAM 2 uh, come in. So ULAM 1, uh, or things that have been carried forward, it's just a regular looking programming language. I mean, if we look 
for the sake of argument, if we look at, uh, <coughs> let's look at SiteWriter. Uh, when we install the package, everything ends up in user lib ulam. Let's see, in the ulam side, share ulam demos. So there's our demos. Uh, the site writer is in the base layer, uh, uh, like that. Uh, um, <coughs> so, so here's the whole thing. Uh, um, we have a data member, which is of type argb which is a four element array where each element is an unsigned eight. So eight bits, uh, an array of four groups of eight bits, 32 bits total. Uh, uh, the behave method is called automatically by the engine when an element, an atom of type site writer, it gets a turn to have an event and it just pulls up its color, modifies it by a random number and writes it back. Now you might think, ooh, what's going to happen around when we have wrap around there? What if I add minus two and the color is only one? It's going to wrap around to 255 and the color is going to completely change. Well, no. <coughs> one of the unusual features in Ulam is that arithmetic is saturating. So uh, one minus two is zero if it's an unsigned, which it is in this case. Uh, although we can't really tell that, we'd have to go look in the site utils, which is one of the standard library packages in order to find out what the type of channel is. But as it happens, it's unsigned. Uh, um, so we modify the color uh, pinning at black and white, if need be. Uh, um, and then we use the site utils package to paint it on the floor. And then finally, we swap ourselves with uh, state one is the guy to the west, site one. We are site zero, state one, site one is the guy to our west. So that would mean sort of go west, except for the fact that we have, where is it? There it is. Uh, we have some metadata declaring that this thing is uh, symmetric. It's rotationally and mirror symmetric, which in the case of the movable feast means every time this guy has an event, pick amongst its legal symmetries at random and apply it. So in this case, white, west might actually be north or what have you. Okay, so Ulam, Ulam 1, from one point of view, it's a very conventional looking language. It's got objects, it's got methods, it's got data members. They're weird data members. Primitives and objects are allocated by the bit. Uh, arithmetic saturates. And then the biggest pain of all, which is the whole point, is that there are no pointers and there's no random access memory. There's just a tiny number of your neighboring sites. We looked at zero, which is where I'm stored. We looked at one, which is one site away, depending on the symmetry and so forth. And so fundamentally, ULAM is a method of programming transition rules, like for a cellular automata, like the game of life. Uh, um, except for relative to standard cellular time, a much bigger uh, a set of neighborhoods and much more particular symbols per state for each one. But unlike traditional programming languages, you can't take a pointer to anything. There is a stack, and you can have functions that call functions that call functions and return, and the stack is assumed to be ample to do serious programming. You can have local variables in uh, stack frames, methods that have been called, but you can't take pointers to them. You can't store them any place. The only persistent memory you have available to you is your event window, that little neighborhood, plus the base layer underneath you, the site paint, and so on. In ULAM2, we add single inheritance, <coughs> like Java, and virtual functions like Java and C++, and we even add reference variables, but they're limited. You can't have a data member that's type reference, because it, it doesn't actually really make sense. Uh, um, all of the persistent memory is out in the event window. Those things do not have addresses, so you can't actually take a reference to them. When you're executing on the stack and you're doing locals inside a function, you can, uh, because all of that stuff is going to disappear as soon as the event is done. The stack unwinds, the event is done, some other guy gets called on his behave function, and off he goes. One of the most aggravating things, which again is fundamental to the mission, is that all objects in Ulam 1 are the same size. Well, they're all fitting inside an atom, which is 96 bits minus a bunch that are used for type information and error checking. So you, the Ulam programmer, only actually get to use 71 bits for an object. <laughs> uh, um, and that's still true for anything that's going to be um, uh, persistent. 
but we now have an, a notion of a transient, which is a struct that acts just like a class pretty much. Uh, you can have transients inheriting from transients and so forth that can be much larger. They can be a, a kilobyte uh, uh, in size if you want. Uh, eventually, there will be a limit on, on stack memory, but you know it's, a, again, imagined to be reasonably ample to do software engineering with. Uh, so you can have them, and the, the keyword is transient, to uh, drive home the fact that they only exist from one entry to a behave function until the time that behave function leaves, uh, um, and you only get to do that for one event. Still no pointers, still no RAM. Okay, so we looked at these little guys. Uh, um, uh, we looked at some of the little demos, but I want to talk about a bigger one, sort of a more of an example of uh, software engineering that I really just got going, uh, uh, which is uh, <coughs> cell 1.0. Now, you know, it's anything but a real sort of biological cell, so th that name should be, you know, taken with salt lick. Uh, um, but the mission of this uh, exercise was to build something, uh, some mechanism that could replicate a relatively large object, where relatively large object means dozens or hundreds of sites maybe, but not necessarily thousands or millions. Since everything is small, we have to size things as we go. But we want to be able to say, okay, here's a pattern, and you go wham, and something happens, and it takes some time, and then we've got two of them, and they're pretty much the same. With best effort results, they are the same. Something might go wrong, but assuming nothing does go wrong, there'll be copies. In order to do this, uh, there's, you know, even though we are programming, we're just programming these individual little transitions one at a time, and they have to compose together by noticing, oh, in my event window, look, I've got some blocks here that they're content. They're the kind of thing that I want to move. Oh, there's a thing I don't care about. I'm going to ignore that, and so on. I have to code all that up. Given that events happen asynchronously, there's no absolute addressing. We cannot say that, well, just give me the contents of location 2634, because there is no 2634. I'm at zero. I'm the center of my event. If I move and get another event, I still think I'm zero, even though it's different than the zero I had on the previous event. When we're starting to talk about objects, we're meaning now collections of atoms, like a molecule or cell. Uh, um, and when you start dealing with this, when you actually start programming it, you have very, very basic stuff. Like, how do you tell whether an atom is considered part of the object or not? And worse, when you're starting to replicate, how do you tell whether this particular atom is part of the parent or part of the kid? You need to tell it apart because different things happen to them once the kid separates from the parent. Uh, uh, so that's the problem of, of distributed control. One of the first things we had to deal with is how do you die cleanly? I mean, you know, when you look at a, a movie, you know, like Tron or Matrix or whatever it is, uh, um, and, and like somebody gets killed inside the digital world, like, you know, they, they, they fall into these bits and then the bits vanish, you know, which is, is very convenient from a point of cinema, you know, instead of having, you know, one pile of uh, half-cooked bits over here and another pile of half-cooked bits over here, like you'd have when someone got chopped with a sword in real life. But how the heck is that supposed to happen? <clears throat> I mean, though all of the things representing that thing, they're distributed in space. They're made of zillions of things that are operating independently. Object identity, clean living, clean dying, basic, basic stuff that comes up in this uh, code. Distributed control, and then finally the software engineering, if, you know, readable code that there's hope for it could it be reused either literally or with modifications for other purposes. And again, in traditional sort of cellular automata stuff, that, that really just d doesn't come up because the entire control system is imagined, number one, to be really part of the physics rather than in this programmable layer. And all of the work is in the layout of the pieces uh, uh, in the grid. Um, but now we're taking a lot of that down. It's on the same idea that, you know, you could build a computer, and this is as uh, uh, Peter Corey mentioned in the comments recently, uh, I think some, some Corey, uh, um, saying, you know, you could take the movable feast and you could implement a NAND gate out of it and then you could have it build up a traditional uh, von Neumann machine on top of it, so isn't that kind of weird? Uh, um, 
<clears throat> and that's absolutely true. But we don't make computers, we don't make actual normal computers today out of NAND gates. You know, we make them out of more complex things because it's more useful. And, and here, we're going to do the same thing. Rather than saying the goal is to find the minimum set, you know, two symbols, neighborhood of four, and so forth, that can lead to a certain behavior. Here, we're deliberately giving ourselves more room to engineer. And that does not make everything sort of magically easy because we still have the fact that it's asynchronous, the object is bigger than the neighborhood, we have to schedule all this, we have to coordinate all this without determinism or synchronous updates. Okay, uh, um, so how are we gonna solve these challenges? Uh, um, we're gonna tell who's in and who's out by having a tag and uh, if you have the same tag as me then we are in the same object you have a different tag uh, you're not uh, we're going to put that tag up in a base class which is actually going to be a template base class uh, uh, so we can say how many bits we want to dedicate to the tag in this demo we have five bit tags and that's going to determine how we're going to kill things and so forth uh, um, and well actually let, let's look Let's look, oh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Oh man, oh, it looks like a half an hour already. This is gonna go forever. Uh, uh, all right, <clears throat> so here's the, the, the way that the, the solution builds up. Uh, um, suppose we take one of these guys. This is, uh, uh, we plop it down and it's a little, I think 16 sight line and it heads east. Uh, we can make a bunch of them and when they run out of the edge of the universe they go away and I developed these things which call them swap lines uh, for uh, to do a little demo in a paper that's going to be coming out in the artificial life journal real soon now uh, um, and it took me the longest time to realize that so what, what these lines what these guys do is they wait and make sure none of their neighbors are behind them the neighbors are all caught up and then they swap themselves forward once and so that way even though the line isn't completely straight it never gets more than 45 degrees it never actually tears okay because everybody at the front waits until the back man catches up all right it took me the longest time to realize, let's see if we make something here, that, um, okay, here's a thing, uh, um, that if these swap lines are swapping uh, to the east, that means anything that they run into is actually moving to the west. Uh, like that. And, and this uh, idea uh, means that, you know, perhaps we could use swap lines to come up for a, a method of large, where this is large now, bigger than an event window. You can actually see the event windows if we want there. Uh, um, uh, uh, let's get a line going. Yeah, so those, the I don't know if you can see it, the little diamond guys here, that's the size of a single event window, and it's flashing around because the events are happening at those various places and so on. Uh, uh, like that. So. Uh, we can get rid of the. Uh, um, we could use the swap lines to move large objects incrementally, and how to move a large object in a cellular automata has been a bit of a challenge for quite some time, and that's why you know in in, the, in Conway's game of life, the glider, this tiny little configuration that moves, is so celebrated, and then the larger spaceships and and all the tractors and various things that they have. Uh, that, that move while retaining their pattern are all sort of inherently interesting. One problem with, again, the sort of deterministic everything out in the world, nothing, this minimal amount in the rule set, is that those things are extremely limited about what they can do. You cannot make a modified glider that has six guys in it and or carries a, a, a different kind of configuration all of its shape is used for the dynamics of moving and repeating in its pattern whereas here uh, um, in principle you know we can change the shape uh, uh, whoops um, we could change the shape uh, uh, we could add other stuff to it uh, um, and if we could figure out a way to uh, release a bunch of swap lines uh, in front of it in some coordinated way we could move the whole thing okay so the problem of large object motion, and a lot of people have taken cracks at this over the years, uh, uh, you know, this would be one way to approach it. 
And the thing that, again, as you sort of think about the design stuff, the reason a swamp line uh, is helpful for this is because it's it's not completely synchronous because the world is not completely synchronous uh, uh, and the world can't be completely synchronous if it's going to be indefinitely scalable but it's a little bit synchronized things wait to, for the back man to catch up so that as long as the line hasn't actually gotten torn or damaged in some way uh, um, we can make certain assumptions about it that if they're if they're not at the end of the line then we're going to see a guy before me next to me or in front of me and those are the only three possibilities so i can tell what's going on locally so a swap line is an example of a little bit of synchronization and what we're trying to do is rather than assume we could have the architecture take care of synchronization for us and always do you know ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk uh, the idea is to use just the amount of synchronization that we need to get <clears throat> the job that we're trying to do done. And by keeping that limited stuff, we leave ourselves open to be able to apply it to different shapes and different circumstances with different inputs in effect. We get more general, more flexible mechanisms if we limit the amount of synchronization that we need to just when we need it. Okay. So I took this idea of the swap line, and once we have this, well, you know, so now we've got a guy who's moving. Why couldn't we, like, as they we're moving him, why couldn't we, like, make a copy of his last line and leave it behind him? And then the next time he moves, makes a copy of his next to last line and leave that there as well and sort of make a on-the-wing replicator. And that's what I did. So here's an example. <coughs> uh, th these are blocks, uh, um, and blocks uh, uh, have a tag, a content tag. Uh, this guy is uh, hex 17. Again, we have five bit tags available like that. Now, by itself, <coughs> uh, block doesn't do anything. But let's pick, let's see, let's go east. Let's plop one of these C plates in here. Oh, and I blew it again. The interface could use some work. Uh, uh, let's get rid of this guy. All right. So a lot is happening here already. Uh, um, uh, when we put down one of these things, what happens is it circumference, circumferences, it plates the whole object all around out to a depth of two. Uh, um, it's this particular atom is called C plate because that's what it does. It does circumferential plating. Uh, um, and it's got a ton of stuff in it. Whoops, uh, uh, a ton of stuff in it. Whoops, and I'm putting that, uh, let me pull that in, uh, um, that we're not going to really look at here. Uh, um, but the m among the many purposes that C plate uh, serves is it isolates the object that's going to be copied. <coughs> it is used to establish a absolute addressing grid from the lower left most point uh, that is in the bounding box of the object to the upper right point of the bounding box of the object. And then each of the uh, C plates within the entire collective localizes themselves relative to that grid. So now once, and, and that's what's actually happening now, so as you, whoops, and, and then once the grid has actually stabilized, we move on to phase two, which is the actual copying step that uses, like the swap lines, except now the swap lines are like tractors and each of them has a trailer going on behind, so it's moving uh, a two, moving the thing two steps at once, and when it gets to the column its job to copy, it replaces the trailer with a modification of the thing that it's copying. And then when it gets to the back, it dumps it off. So let's just let this finish for now and see. If it's pretty cool. Uh, um. Replication. It's cool. Uh, uh, <coughs> we can we can send guys in different directions. Uh, um, oh, and once again, come on. <coughs> uh, uh, north. Send this guy north. Send this guy south. Uh, um, and so on. <coughs> oh, now actually, look at, see, now that guy's kind of messing up uh, uh, because he's getting interference right in here. 
he hasn't managed to successfully finish the plating because he's running into interference from the kid that the other one is making. But actually, in this particular case, it looked like the kid got out of the way, and now this guy is just behind, and hopefully he will su su successfully localize and uh, maybe move on to actually making a copy. Uh, he may not. Uh, there are any number of ways that the replication can fail. Uh, um, <coughs> in fact, uh, we can induce one uh, uh, deliberately if we want. Uh, um, and again, what happened there? All of the C plate, all of the stuff associated with the replication disappeared, uh, uh, but the object was left behind. There are other, we can get into worse situations where in fact the thing uh, will, will kill the object entirely. Uh, uh, we'll give it another shot. Uh, um, and <coughs> but in that case, uh, it was a miscarriage, but otherwise it, it worked okay. So what this is, it's kind of like, you know, it's like, well, it's like a 3D printer, right, working layer by layer, except it's, it's only in 2D making 1D layers, so it's kind of a, a, a 2D printer, uh, like that, which is only one sort of limited but very effective approach to replication. Um, the... One of the goals of the original replication stuff, going all the way back to von Neumann and cellular automata, uh, uh, was to explore this duality between, like, DNA. They didn't know what DNA was at the time, but to, to explore the duality between components of physical systems being interpreted as control, execution, things to do, and being then just taken as absolutely passive data. And in this case, we're doing reproduction, in essence, by uh, self-inspection uh, um, and we're we're actually you know since we're able to spread ourselves out as we pass swap lines through uh, uh, we can inspect a given line and say okay well I need another guy like that oh did I send that guy to the east <sighs> all right so there's another one that's sort of messed up now it, it turns out this will eventually uh, uh, clean up a a after itself but it'll take a very long time because that's our absolute last backstop. In addition to the uh, being able to uh, abort a replication, uh, we also have poison. Uh, oops. Uh, uh, what's it? Oh, okay. That made a liar out of me. There we go. Poison. Uh, um, that. So we really wanted to send a guy west. So why don't we send this guy west and uh, maybe he'll run into that poison and then he'll have a sad outcome. Uh, um, this is a lot of fun to play with. This is not, oh, see, there we go. This is not yet uh, in one of the demos. This is brand new. Uh, um, but how does this actually work? We're going to talk about software engineering. Let's talk about software engineering. Uh, um, the circumferential plate, the C plate, has a bunch of jobs. These are some of the data members. This is, you know, little UML. Uh, um, with 71 bits, uh, um, so what do we got? We got S2D. S2D is a data type that is an array of two 7-bit numbers like that. So an S2D takes up 14 bits all by itself, which is a lot in uh, Ulam land. I mean, once you start figuring out this stuff, it's 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 kind of like sort of like bonsai programming. You know, you're making these little teeny things where you know one bit here is all you need. Oh, that's really three bits. Couldn't I do it with two bits? Which is it's fun. It's got a sort of purity and a cleanliness, sort of like assembly language, uh, in some ways. But the size of an S2D being seven bits, uh, uh, that determines our sort of build plate in you know uh, 3D printer land. Uh, so we can build, we can, we have a chance at replicating things up to uh, 128 by 128 more or less. Uh, it doesn't mean that's all very likely to succeed in any case, but that's our capability. Uh, uh, we have a source, which is really quite nice. Uh, um, can't take the time to talk about it now. But every time uh, a C plate, which just automatically spreads around the object, every time a C plate creates a, an offspring, it sets the source of the offspring to point back to it. 
So in fact, when we got done and we had, uh, um, where is it here? You know, if we take one of these guys, and I'm just going to start him up a little bit and then stop him. Uh, uh, well, he's not running. Uh, uh, all right. So here's the C plate, uh, um, like this guy. Uh, oops, I did it again. Uh, um, his source is 15. We have to look in the thing and find out which site number that is. Uh, you really want to have the uh, the event window picture. I guess I don't have it here. Where can we see it here? Oh, here. Yeah. I was trying to figure out how to get the volume be right. If you go to robust.ucs.unm.edu, uh, uh, the uh, here. So site 15 is up one and two to the left uh, from me, and that's the guy who created me like that. And so if we do this, if we track the source here, that the source actually creates, is a parent pointer in the offspring tree. And so this entire uh, C plate collective around this whole thing, in fact, is also a, a uh, NRE tree, a general tree, that you can trace from the last guy who was born through his parent all the way back to the root, wherever it was I started this guy. Did I start it? Uh, yeah, I started it there, and we can tell because he's the only guy who has a source of zero, which is himself. And the algorithms take advantage of the fact that the C plate has two addressing mechanisms. It has XY coordinates. I am located at 4, 4. The guy below me is located at 4, 5, and so forth. Uh, uh, but also it takes, care, uh, takes advantage of the tree uh, uh, structure in order to uh, sort of break ties and bias the gossiping algorithms that work. It's a little detailed, but it's very nice on the one hand, and it's also familiar computer science. These are these are trees. Uh, uh, <coughs> unlike typical trees where we try to make them as bushy as possible, these are very long, straggly trees, but they have uses nonetheless. And we are representing an NRE tree. Where is we are representing an NRE tree in four bits. And how can we do that? We can do that because we know that our parent is in the same event window as us. It can with four bits we have enough in the in the way that the C plate uses it to find all of those possible locations for our parent. And if the parent needs to go the other way, if the parent needs to go down to the kid, it can just search that location in its neighborhood and look for guys who are pointing back at it. So we can navigate in both directions in this tree. Again, only one smaller, uh, small number of steps in a given event, but over time we can pass information up the tree to the root, we can broadcast information from the root out to the leaves, and so on. C plate is not a standalone class, it inherits from UGrid content, which is in charge of forming the absolute localization, forming the localization, finding the zero point, and so forth. Uh, um, and C to D is, uh, these are 16-bit 2D coordinates, so each C to D takes 32 bits, which we really do not want to blow 32 bits, uh, especially because we have two coordinates down here. That would be 64 bits right there just to remember where I am and how big the space is. So that's why we use the little squish down one and accept a smaller build plate in order to have room to do other things with our bits. Uh, so UGrid content perform, provides mapping operations. It's not it either. UGrid con uh, <coughs> content inherits from rotate content, content which has a, a two-bit data member that specifies uh, a rotation relative to east is east and north is north. So the reason that we have an east C plate and a west C plate and so forth is because those trigger C plates with a different orientation. So that we can when we make a guy who's heading south, the code is all written as if he's heading west, I think. And then the rotation is being implied transparently by rotate content. Uh, um, and rotate content in turn inherits, whoops, inherits from content. Uh, um, and content inherits from this thing called QID. And that's where we actually start. And QID is uh, <coughs> a, a Q stands for quark. Anything that's smaller than an atom, well, Anything that an atom is going to, an element is going to inherit from, is a quark. <coughs> so QID is a quark. So is content. So is rotate content, Ugrid content, and so forth. 
<clears throat> they're kind of like abstract classes. They're sort of, you know, they can have data members, but they're sort of incomplete until they've finally been instantiated as an element. And from elements, we can make instances that are called objects. QID is a template because you can provide uh, information to say, you know, everybody has to have a given species ID, and that ends up costing nothing because it gets compiled into the code and represented by the type of the atoms rather than by in the small number of data members. The number of tag bits we set to five, <coughs> the number of progress bits. The other thing that IDs prov provide, QID provides, is a timeout watchdog. And there it is, yeah, it provides a progress method. So the code down below needs to call progress every so often, or eventually the watchdog will not only destroy uh, the guy who failed to show a watchdog, but in calling it this emergency death method. Uh, here we have, we've got the sample. So this is what the behave method looks like at the level of QID. It calls super.behave, which in this case there isn't any super, so it inherits from ERSELF, the sort of analog to object in Java. <coughs> and then all, all it does is uh, count the watchdog, increment the watchdog, and if it reaches the alarm level, it calls emergency death, which erases itself, but first it looks everywhere in the neighborhood and signals emergency death on everything else. Uh, uh, and that's, in fact, how the uh, poison works and the uh, replication terminator works. Uh, uh, the poison actually signals emergency death. The, uh, the replication terminator is handled lower down, and that's why it can actually leave the parent, uh, um, at least in some cases. So uh, <coughs> this is a lot of stuff. So um, even squishing the... D data members, the coordinates down to 14 bits is not enough for the uh, all the uh, things that we need to do. So in fact, C plate has, uh, yeah, here, so this, this thing U, <coughs> which is not uh, labeled with M, so it's not really good uh, programming practice, we're not being systematic about our data members, is uh, a union. Um, and so all of the, uh-oh, uh, um, uh, uh, so here we go. Uh, uh, so there are three phases in the whole process. Grow is, you know, surround, the, build the C plate out and perform localization. Grow is when we actually uh, do the copying line by line. And then kid is at the end when we're done and we're going to separate it and strip out, dissolve away uh, the C plating. And each of those, being a union, gets to have different use of uh, the same bits uh, like that. And the reason I wanted to bring this all up is that <coughs> the copying mechanism has to do some pretty tricky synchronization. And so here, for example, we've got, um, okay, well, let's get rid of this guy. Uh, um, we've got this green guy and this red guy. And those are really C plate. Of course, I just got rid of it and now I want it back. Uh, um, they are C plate. These are all C plates and so forth. But what makes this thing special is he's the leftmost highest uh, C plate that exists, and, and this guy is the rightmost, uh, southernmost C plate that exists. And <coughs> so uh, this guy becomes the uh, in charge of. Well, I run a little bit <coughs> there. Um, so this guy is in charge of issuing the swap lines to be copied. He is the head commander. This guy at the back is the tail commander. He's in charge of allowing the lines to release into the kit. And if you look, it, it's a little hard to see in this one that the line actually squares up. It can get kind of wiggly as it goes through, but once it gets to the tail commander, everybody dresses the line uh, and so that we know everybody is ready to move into the next phase and everybody waits until the tail commander releases them. Uh, um, and in order for this, I mean, there, there might be other ways to write this, but, you know, this is the way I was managing to get it to work. Uh, um, and, uh, all right, there it is. Uh, um, <clears throat> let me get the south one going just for uh, every single time. Uh, uh, it's like... Sideshow Bob and the Rakes. Uh, um, 
so now the head commander and tail commander are on different axes because the thing's heading down uh, um, and so on but the head commander does not release the next swap line until the tail commander reports that it's gone through and how do they do that well if you look at the little dots of color inside the C plates here they're shifting between red and green and blue and actually what they're doing is uh, <clears throat> they're sort of playing a little game of rock, paper, scissors with each other. Rock is red, uh, uh, paper is green, and scissors is blue. And the only one who's allowed to change uh, to scissors is the head commander. The only one who's allowed to change to rock is the tail commander. And the only one who's allowed to change to paper is the root, the original guy where this all standard all uh, started. And they work together to um, uh, coordinate between it. And again, this is another example of, where's my UML? Um, this is another example of how we use a limited amount of synchronization, just what we need in order to do it, in order to get a coordinated action done at a distance like that. So we have a rock, paper, scissors class whose job is that, and, <coughs> and that costs us two bits. And in fact, we represent it as a unary two-bit number because we only need three states, 0, 1, and 2. And that's all that you can represent with two bits expressed in base 1. <coughs> all right, running out of time, way running out of time here. Uh, um, so this is a non-trivial from some points of view, certainly from compared to the burn demo and the fork bombs and so on. This is a non-trivial amount of code. Uh, that, that UML diagram was not complete. That was just some samples of the classes. It didn't actually have the behavior classes that were involved. There's a separate class for controlling when we're doing grow and copy and kid, although the kid's very short. <coughs> um, but um, it's a way to be a flexible object replicator that works with pretty high reliability as long as it isn't impacted by events happening around the, in the world and to some degree it even handles uh, uh, unexpected events either by miscarrying or in the worst case by actually cleanly killing the object that was trying to replicate. All right. Looking forward, uh, um, language development continues. There's much more that we could want in the language. Uh, um, I really want to get the motion. I mean, so this, in a way, kind of a little bit out of order because this sort of took the motion technology and is applying it to, to replication. <coughs> it would be nice if these guys could just move themselves around without it cells control their own motion and replication and we really want to start mo looking forward towards uh, tiles uh, making a new prototype tiles we're probably going to use one of these little tiny system on modules that will run Linux so that the port of the code that's currently running in the simulator to the tile won't be that hard the tiles will be incredibly expensive compared to what they could be if they were optimized for it but again they can serve as a line in the sand uh, um, and and that's about it and let's do one last one or maybe we can just sort of leave this running and it's worth noting that you know we can actually reproduce things other than just block content as long as they're sort of surrounded by uh, uh, block content so that when the circumferential plating comes through uh, uh, it'll know what is supposed to count as inside and outside uh, so why don't we send this guy north here uh, um, see if that works. <clears throat> Bigger objects take a lot longer to localize, uh, uh, and there's just in general uh, more, it's a, a higher risk replication. Uh, uh, Actually, uh, this guy is, is going to be heading, you know, this dark area here is, is in between two tiles where there's significant time shear 
uh, you know, tidal effects due to the communication delays between the things, which also uh, can stress the uh, mechanisms. As much as possible, I tried to make the mechanisms interlock uh, uh, so that if something isn't ready because, for example, time is running slower where it is, uh, other guys will wait. But there are still, in particular, the ending of the growth phase, determining when we have localized and we're not going to see any more and the coordinates have set, involves a certain amount of ballistics and timing. And <coughs> there can be failures. Uh, we're probably in pretty good shape here because now we're into the copy phase and that's a little bit more robust. Is this the be-all, end-all of object replication? Absolutely not. It's, you know, it's kind of brute force. I mean, it would be nice to... Uh, you know, have the thing grow from the inside from a seed, a whole different approach. It would be nice if it could handle things that in a sort of more, you know, sloppy way rather than this, you know, literal line at a time. And one of the other things that C plate does, I didn't get to talk about, is it does passivization. Uh, uh, <coughs> the, all the everything that was inheriting from content, the blue blocks in this case, when they see C plate around, they suppress their normal activity. I mean, because these things are all happening in parallel. Those res that I stuck inside the O there, uh, they would be trying to move if they could because they don't inherit from content. They don't know what's going on. Now, in this case, they were in an area that was small enough that C plate got in there and kind of immobilized them all, sort of like in gel. Uh, um, but in a more general case, if you make a larger object uh, with this thing with big gaps, uh, uh, you can have all kinds of difficulties because things will be moving around and doing their normal whatever they do while the swap lines are moving through and trying to copy them. And in fact, it's easy to end up with not quite exact duplicates. And, you know, there's an awful lot of, of development that has to be done between here and there. But it's possible that we could end up seeing evolution happening not because it was programmed in deliberately like we do with typical genetic algorithms and A-Life software models, but just because that's what happens because of our best effort implementation of replication, motion, and so forth in this world uh, uh, of best effort computing. I think those in fact aren't quite, no, they might be seven res each, not sure. That's it for now. Robert, I hope this was long enough for you. Thanks for watching.